Hello friends, I would like to introduce you to the Fujifilm X-H1. X-H1, meet everyone. In this video, I will give you my super practical, non-toxic review of this guy. No shenanigans, just how I used it and how I liked it, plus a lot of photos. I borrowed the X-H1 along with the 10 to 24 millimeter f4 lens and the 100 to 400 millimeter f4.5 to 5.6 lens. I also used my own 28 millimeter f2 Voigtlander lens, which is an M mount lens, but I used an adapter to use the lens on the X-H1. But before I jump into the details of my review, I'm going to tell you kind of an embarrassing story about one day during the last week that I had the camera when I was out just before sunrise with the X-H1 and the 100 to 400 millimeter lens. I went to a desert -y riparian area that I frequent to test camera gear. It wasn't quite sunrise yet, but I knew that the many jackrabbits, birds, and lizards at the park would be starting to move around because it was already getting hot out. So I'm walking down the path, not seeing much of anything yet. And quite frankly, it was kind of too dark yet for me to expect any award-winning photos, but out of the corner of my eye, I see a chase and it turned out to be a young coyote chasing its breakfast, a jackrabbit. So as quickly as I could, I turned on the camera and the external Atomos recording device that I had attached as I was bringing it all up to my face. Luckily I had the camera set because the evening prior I had set it up at shutter priority with a shutter speed of 1 500th to capture those jackrabbits. I used auto ISO and continuous autofocus with focus tracking. So I was all ready to go. So as I got the camera up to my face as soon as I could, I took a whole slew of photos. I even switched autofocus modes in the middle to be more precise where the focus was because the coyote was being so patient with me. After I got my fill of photos though, 125 to be exact, I left the young man to hopefully replace his breakfast with some other unfortunate rabbit. And I went on my way without a second thought that the images turned out. I walked around and I captured a ton more photos of other flora and fauna in the park. However, once I got back to the car, I indulged myself a little in image playback on the back of the camera. And I realized that the images that I took of the coyote, which were taken before the sun was really up at a fast shutter speed, were completely black. As you can imagine, I was beside myself, not only because I messed up, but because I realized immediately what I had done. The last time I had used the camera, I had changed the auto ISO setting to be more constricted, only allowing the camera to use up to ISO 1600. I had forgotten to change it back to give it free reign up and down the native ISO scale. When I got home, I pulled the photos into Lightroom just to see if, just in case, I could pull something out of the images. And look what happened. Because I was shooting in RAW on that fine Fuji camera, I was able to pull out every last detail, shot after shot. And I feel like I could stop here with this review. I made a huge mistake and the camera still had my back, but I wanted to lead with that story because it's unbelievable. I will discuss later how the camera handles fast action and how the autofocus does and such, but for now, I won't stop here. Let's move on to the review. In this review, I will discuss what I enjoyed about the camera, what maybe I didn't enjoy so much. I'll discuss where the camera excels and where it struggled. I will share some technical specifications, but I will put them into context for you because tables of specifications can be helpful, but what you really need to know is how those specs apply to you. And I'll share a ton of photos because I was able to use the X-H1 for a few weeks and I made the most of it. To give you a little context, I am not totally new to Fuji. I have used a few other Fujifilm cameras and I do own an X100F, but every camera is different. So what I did in those few weeks that I had the camera was see how the X-H1 performs in a variety of situations because I believe that these Fuji cameras are really made for the photographer that enjoys the process of photography. I mean, look at this beauty, those dials, right? And because of the specifications of the camera, it is an all around shooter. Great for a person who might be taking landscapes one day, a bit of action the next, 
maybe some astrophotography even, and all at a reasonable cost. I'll put a link below so that you can see how much this is in your area and at the time that you're watching this, but you really are getting a lot of capability for the price. Just to put it into perspective, right now in the US, this camera is $999 on Amazon with an accessory vertical grip. And it's Fuji's flagship body, just short of their medium format cameras. Yes, the X-H1 is at the top of the X-System line, but as I am filming this, it is not a brand new model. The X-H1 was released early in 2018, and there are other models in the X-System that have been refreshed with updated sensors and such. But as we saw with my Coyote experience, the 24 megapixel sensor in this camera is still very good. Speaking of this sensor, it is an APS-C sensor. In fact, the entire Fuji X-System lineup is mirrorless and APS-C. As a side note, Fuji does not offer any full-frame cameras, though they do have a medium format line of bodies and lenses. But back to the crop sensor mirrorless. What does that mean for you and for me as we are using the camera in the real world? It means a relatively compact form factor, relatively lightweight. The lenses were built for the APS-C sensor, so they are also more compact and lightweight than their full-frame counterparts would be. It's handy when you can have a small setup, but even when you're talking about the telephoto lens like I used, I definitely noticed that it was smaller and lighter than the full-frame counterparts that I have used from Nikon and from Sony. The cropped sensor also means that the 10 to 24 millimeter lens gave me the same field of view as a 15 to 36 millimeter would on a full-frame camera. I particularly enjoyed having that flexibility to go from ultra-wide all the way to a 35 millimeter equivalent with that lens. It made the lens a lot more practical for me for everyday use. And then the 100 to 400 millimeter lens gave me the same field of view as a 150 to 600 millimeter lens would on a full frame camera. That's a lot of reach and a relatively small package. I like to handhold my cameras because I like to be nimble, so I particularly appreciated that. While we're on the subject of lenses, let's jump into image quality. Both the camera body and the lenses make a difference in image quality, so I want to discuss both. I was not let down by either. In fact, it was quite the opposite. I would say that image quality on this camera with both of these Fuji lenses is stellar. Sometimes when you have a variable aperture lens like this telephoto, you can tend to get less crisp images but that was not the case with this lens. Now, ISO sensitivity has an impact on overall image quality as well. Exactly where in the range and the amount of noise in the image that you find objectionable is a personal preference, but let's take a look at a high ISO image. The X-H1 has a native ISO range of 200 to 12,800, and this astrophotography image was taken at ISO 8,000. It certainly has noise, but with a little bit of noise reduction and post-processing, this is what you get. Discussing overall image quality, like I said, I was not disappointed. I achieved very crisp images. Plus don't forget Fuji's awesome film simulations. If you aren't familiar with them, you can apply these simulations in camera and achieve specific film-like looks. This is especially nice when you only want to shoot JPEG and do little or no post-processing later on. That being said, you can pull an incredible amount of dynamic range out of the raw images. You can edit Fuji's raw images in any raw image editor, but Fuji does have free software. The caveat with the X-RAW Studio is that you have to plug in the camera to the computer to use it. One cool thing about it though is that you can apply any of the film simulations to your RAW images and you are getting the same output as you would if you shot JPEG. Incidentally, whether you shoot RAW or JPEG, you can also edit the image further in software whether or not you apply those film simulations. And now I should mention here that you can also apply an approximation of those film simulations both in Lightroom and Capture One. However, I have heard from many Fuji diehards that the colors aren't quite right, at least not in Lightroom. That being said, I've done some conversions there and I am not displeased with the results. The advantage with Fuji's own software is that the camera itself is actually processing the images, so you're getting exactly what Fuji intended with your adjustments. So image quality is important, but using the camera is important too. 
Is it easy to use? Is it responsive? How quick is it? I didn't quite have the muscle memory with this camera to move super duper fast with it, but if I were to use it for a few more weeks, I definitely would have been buzzing along. You can configure how you use this camera like a whole lot of other cameras. For example, if you want to be faster with the camera, you can set the command dials to adjust aperture and shutter speed, or shutter speed and ISO sensitivity, whatever will make you faster with how you like to shoot. If I had customized to have the shutter speed on one of those command dials, I would have decreased my shutter speed with that coyote when he sat down for me, for example, to allow my ISO sensitivity to decrease allowing me to capture images with less noise. As it was, I was adjusting shutter speed with the dial on the top of the camera. So in a landscape or nature or portrait situation, I would prefer that top dial. But in the action situation, I would like the command dial. And I appreciate that Fuji allows me to do both. This is not a lightning fast camera for tracking fast action as compared to the cropped sensor and more expensive Nikon D500 or some of the top of the line Sony cameras, which are much more expensive. The Fuji can certainly do the job for action, for portraits and landscapes, but it's not going to track as fast as some cameras that are designed for ultimate tracking speed. Now I'm very much aware that it's 14 frames per second, which is great, but better tracking, which I'm sure Fuji is working on, will ultimately make that speed more usable. One thing that I found surprising about the detection and tracking autofocus on the X-H1 is that it does have eye autofocus, but not during continuous autofocus. And I found that a little bit limiting. And while there is tracking, it does struggle in less than ideal conditions like low light or when the subject isn't against a plain background. Now, am I being picky here? Yeah, <laughs> I am. Autofocus detection and focus tracking have become so advanced in some of the brands, Sony in particular, that the bar is set very high for what can be done. It's impossible for me not to draw some informal comparisons as I am using different gear. Also, keep in mind that I'm talking eye or face detect tracking here, not general autofocus. The general autofocus capability of the camera is great. And if you aren't particularly interested in focus tracking and eye detect, you will have no complaints. I should also mention a little more on the vertical power booster grip. It holds two batteries, so you get twice the life, faster operation on the camera as it can lean on both batteries and it has um, vertical controls on it and even a headphone jack for audio monitoring. Unlike Fuji's similar X-T3, with the X-H1, you do have five axis image stabilization in body for both stills and video. I found the stabilization between the camera and the telephoto lens to be superb. Also, for those serious about their video, you have F-Log internally, which allows you more advanced color grading, and you can film it up to 4K at 30 frames per second. Something that I hear often is that viewers want to purchase a full frame body because they want better low light performance. There is a point where a current generation full frame body will perform better than a current generation APS-C body. But the difference is probably less than you anticipate. Don't count out a crop sensor body just because you think you'll get much better performance in low light. Whether to you that means faster autofocus or a lesser amount of noise. The two lenses I was using weren't even fast lenses. The ultra wide was an f4 lens and the telephoto was an f4.5 to 5.6. And I was happy with how the camera performed and focused in low light. If you are looking at the Fuji bodies, I can say that this one sets the standard by bringing in body image stabilization and Fuji's legendary, very tactile control scheme. I thoroughly enjoyed using the X-H1. And as a side note, the two lenses I used were also a delight. So thank you to Fuji for allowing me to borrow this gear. I have a few more places that you can see this camera and my results from it and the other Fuji gear that I've used. 
First, there is a link in the description to my gear reviews playlist, which has reviews of Fuji and other gear. There's a link to the X-H1 and all of the lenses I used on Amazon, including the Leica M mount to Fuji X lens adapter. Shout out to all of those of you who support this channel by using those links. I have also linked to several videos where I've done astrophotography and more with the Fuji cameras. But before you go check those things out, let me know your thoughts about the Fuji X system down below in the comments. Do you have one? Or is this system more of a curiosity for you? Or do you think that the next Fuji flagship is right around the corner? And if so, what are you excited about? Thanks for watching.